All right, so once we have our ingredients mixed together, we've spun up the solar system, it's now a flat disk, and now we're gonna let it cool. So solids will now condense out of the solar system where it is cool enough for them to do so, and they will form planetesimals over time as they stick together. We've talked about this process quite a bit before. And as this um, sort of cooling process is occurring, what is the profile of the temperature in the solar disk? All right, exactly. So the temperature is hot near the sun and it drops off to be very cold at the edge of the solar system. Even though the sun in this stage of solar system formation is not yet an actual star, it's still tremendously hot. And the reason for that is it's been um, contracting. It's been gravitationally contracting just as the solar um, system nebula was once. So the sun is still essentially shrinking, um, gathering together gravitationally. And as it does so, it's pulling gas molecules in and that contraction leads to heating. You can think of some of this as coming from friction, but it's really being released by gravitational potential energy being turned into kinetic energy motion of the molecules. So you can think of it essentially as friction heating. So yes, the temperature is hottest near the sun, coldest far away. And what does that mean for the density of materials that can condense out at different points? Yeah, so near the sun, that's where our higher density materials are able to freeze out condense out of the vaporized set of starting materials. And specifically, if we look at the temperature profile at different locations according to the orbits of our planets, um, and then see what sort of um, materials can condense at that temperature, then we'll find that metals and metal oxides can condense at the hottest temperatures, silicates, iron oxides, and olivines, so sort of rocky materials, are in between. And then things like hydrated minerals, ices containing water, require lower temperatures in order to condense. And then finally, um, even lighter ices such as water, ammonia, and methane. Those are some of the things that are in our outer worlds. Um, those require the, the coldest temperatures to be able to condense. All right, so because of this, Different objects in our solar system are made of different materials according to their locations. So there's actually a name for the place where water can form in a solar disk. What is that called? Okay, I see quite a few votes for habitable zone. And it's true that that is generally defined as the area where liquid water is able to form in the solar system. But the closest distance in the solar system where water can condense out of the solar nebula is the distance where water would be ice. And so for that reason, this is called the snow line. It's farther away than the habitable zone. So let me show you a picture just to kind of build some intuition here. If the, you know, star has some temperature, then close to the star, water will not be able to con condense out to form ice. And so we're looking for the position where water can condense out into a solid form. And that's gonna be at some radius away from the star, depending on its temperature. So th the snow line for our own solar system, where do you suppose that is located based on what you know about the composition of different solar system objects. Yeah, so we know that it shouldn't be one because we know that water is able to be liquid on Earth and so it wouldn't be ice here. So, so one would be more like a habitable zone location, not a snow line. So then we're stuck between two and three and we know that the outer worlds definitely contain ice. All of the moons on those outer worlds have some ice. Um, but notice the location of this line is drawn between Saturn and Uranus. And we know that the moons of Saturn are very icy and the moons of Jupiter are icy as well. 
So we know that it has to actually be farther in than either of those. And so location two is our best choice here. And so that is where our snow line actually is. It's in the asteroid belt at about three AU is the location where water ice can form. So um, it might seem a little bit confusing that out past the reaches of the asteroid belt, that's where all of the water was able to condense out of the disk. And farther in, water would not have been able to condense into a solid. So that means that our terrestrial planets should have formed mostly in the absence of water. So then where the heck did all of Earth's water come from? See what you think. All right. Yeah, so the leading theory of how water arrived on Earth is that it came here as ice on planetesimals. So during that early stage of violent collisions in the early solar system, some of those objects would have contained ice and those would have brought water to Earth. Um, this isn't by any means a closed scientific question. And there are actually new results out that say that um, some planetesimals don't have the right kind of water. Um, you can you can look at water and there's some fraction of what we call heavy water deuterium in regular water and the um, mixture of types of water on some planetesimals like Ceres isn't the right mix to match the earth's water so it's still an open question as to how exactly water got here um, but most astronomers think that um, it was because of collisions all right, when we look at where water is in the solar system, we can start to see the idea of the snow line more pronounced. So looking at these different moons of Saturn and Jupiter, and also when we look at Pluto and other planetesimals in the Kuiper belt, then they contain a lot more water than Earth. Earth, of course, has the more most water of all terrestrial planets, um, but still, um, moons like Europa and Callisto that are actually smaller than Earth have more water than Earth does. So now in our solar system formation process, we have spun into a flat disk, we have cooled material out, and now it's time for those bits to collide together to form planets and collect atmospheres. So returning to the idea of atmospheres that we've talked about quite a bit, um, which gases made up the primary atmospheres of all of our planets? All right, so I see two popular answers still. One popular answer is hydrogen and carbon dioxide, and the other one is hydrogen and helium. But notice that I'm asking you about the primary atmospheres of all planets. So I guess my question for you is, is carbon dioxide plentiful in the atmospheres of all planets? And it is not, it is not plentiful in the atmospheres of our gas giants. So all of the planets had primary atmospheres made of hydrogen and helium. The entire solar disk was still permeated, filled with hydrogen and helium, in addition to all of the other trace materials that condensed out into solids to form our planets. So it was this hydrogen and helium that formed the primary atmospheres of the planets once they gathered up enough mass to start to attract some of that gas into their atmospheres. So um, it didn't last forever, which is why you're probably not thinking of hydrogen and helium as part of the primary atmospheres, because soon after the sun ignited, it started to emit the solar wind. Uh, this is a steady stream of particles that flows away from the sun. And it was responsible for blowing away the leftover gas and dust that would have been left in the solar disk. So we've met the solar wind before, these hot charged particles that emit from the sun. So what else has the solar wind been responsible for in this class? All right, yeah, so last time we saw that the solar wind 
who was responsible for creating the ion tails of comets. Um, it does not create planetary magnetic fields, but it does interact with them to create the auroras. So just a little bit of review there. So that's the entire solar system formation process. Um, now, after this, we move into what we would consider planetary evolution. <laughs> 